Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> hopefully people can hear me. So interesting fact about this Einstein quote, it's actually unclear whether he said this, <laughs> but it's of course just Occam's razor anyway. So, so it appears that the majority um, <clears throat> of the people uh, online uh, were here for the first session. So we're at 91%. Um, for those of you who were not here at the first session, um, this will probably, um, you know, uh, you might want to go back and listen to it. Um, if you're interested in just using concepts, uh, you know, you might want to go back and, and look at that part. This part of the talk is going to be more abstract. Um, there will be a little bit of minutia about, you know, how concepts are evaluated as part of writing it. Um, and then I'm going to walk you through uh, actually an experiment. Um, sort of a design experiment um, with trying to write concepts for time. And so we'll see some, again, the trade-offs there. Um, and then I'm going to pull you to the very top of the ladder. As I said in the beginning, um, I see this as a ladder that we're walking up. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to try and pull you back to the top rung of the ladder and step back and say, what are we really talking about uh, when we're talking about design? What are the things we're looking for? Um, and so we're going to want to step back and really look at what do concepts provide to the overall uh, design space that we have. Okay. So how are constraints evaluated? So we were looking at the end of the last section um, <clears throat> at constraints themselves. Uh, and now, you know, there's this question of, you know, how do we actually evaluate um, the constraints um, themselves? What happened to the poll there? Sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so how are the constraints of uh, one of these expression clauses um, or uh, uh, how do they actually evaluate? Well, so there's really a two-step process. Um, the first step is uh, each one of the concepts gets normalized. So you can basically think of that as a substitution into uh, all of the and and or logic. Um, <clears throat> it gets rolled up into one big uh, normalized expression with the ands and ors. And then there's this step called subsumption. Uh, and this is where the concepts are looked at. Uh, and it's going to define uh, some sort of a partial ordering of the constraints. And so the constraint uh, P will subsume a constraint Q if the compiler can show that, um, you know, P implies Q directly. So in other words, you know, if uh, P has all of the constraints that Q has, uh, plus some additional ones, then it's said to subsume. Uh, we're going to see a little bit of an example of this. Um, this is where I told you in the first session um, that I wasn't going to teach you to be a language lawyer here. Um, <clears throat> this is a very complicated thing. Um, and Andrew Sutton, who wrote the uh, concept uh, TS implementation for GCC, mentions that essentially what we have is we have you know, a, a little constraint solver uh, within GCC now um, that does this unpacking and does this subsume logic. Um, in general, one thing to note here, um, and this is where the type traits versus concepts uh, comes back to us again, um, type traits don't get uh, considered in subsumption. They're considered a, an atomic thing. And so um, we're gonna see that that's where maybe using type traits isn't always the best way to do it. Now we can always just lift a type trait into a concept uh, with a one line of code situation. Uh, so it's not hard to make them into concepts. But the principle here when we're doing things like overload resolution is we're gonna pick the most constrained uh, uh, option that we can. Um, uh, and that's what the compiler is gonna pick. So let's look at an example and actually, uh, this is derived from, you know, an example that you could see. So, uh, and I'm actually going to show you something new here that I didn't show you in the last session. So 
Uh, one of the other things we can do with concepts, right, is, you know, we can specialize a, a template class, uh, class template, sorry. Um, and so you see here we have at the beginning, uh, we have a primary template called wrapper. Um, and this is actually required here. If we don't write this, um, we can't do the following uh, sections. Um, and then we have a constrained template. It's constrained by this concept signed integral, uh, which from the last session you'll remember is uh, one of the ones that's in C++20. Uh, and okay, so we have this little wrapper of T uh, and all it does is if it matches is it, you know, prints signed integral out. Uh, and then we have another one down here, which is constrained on integral itself. So which one is the compiler going to select uh, and how is this going to work? So we can see here, if I instantiate wrapper of uh, int or wrapper of unsigned, I get exactly what you would expect, um, which is that the uh, signed integral matches signed integral and the unsigned matches unsigned. So what's the actual process though that is going on in the resolution of this? So to do that, we have to look and we have to look at what is it exactly that we have uh, in the concept itself. Um, so this is the definition of sign integral. Um, so we have the first concept here, which is integral itself. Uh, and then we have uh, is sign V. So we have a, a trait um, that says, okay, if, it's, if this type is actually signed. Uh, and then the definition of integral itself um, <clears throat> is, is sign integral V. So you can see here we have two type traits that form the sort of atomic level uh, constraints that go into the concepts themselves, right? Um, and so, and of course here we have the conjunction logic. Um, so really the first step here um, in looking at this is to say, well, uh, we're going to look at the conjunction logic and we're going to unwrap the fundamental things here. And of course, signed integral is defined in terms of integral itself. So the compiler can figure out that, oh, this is the exact same thing as this. Uh, and then it can say, well, because this one has additional constraints, it is the more uh, specific constraint uh, and therefore uh, signed integral uh, subsumes integral. And so it works the way you want it to. Now I can make one small change to this program and I can make it not work anymore. Um, and specifically that is if I write this type trait as a requires in uh, the wrapper uh, uh, in the wrapper itself like this, then this becomes ambiguous. And that's because um, these type traits here when they're not part of a concept themselves uh, do not play within the subsumption. So the compiler cannot figure out um, that this, signed integral is the same as this one and do the subsumption process. Okay. Uh, so the question in the chat is why use integral for the first concept, um, but integral V for the second one, um, and isn't one concept the other half a tri type trait? So I didn't write this concept, so to be clear, these are standard library concepts. Uh, and so they're, perf they're designed specifically with that in mind. Um, and so the reason we want to write a concept here for this one is so that the subsumption process can happen. Uh, if I took uh, this, if I replaced the, another way to break the program uh, would be to say, instead of writing some, uh, STD integral of T here, I wrote is sign integral of T there, uh, then I also would not get subsumption to work um, and the, it would fail to compile as an ambiguous as well. Okay, good question. All right, so that's mainly what I'm going to talk about in terms of subsumption. I said I wasn't going to make you language lawyers. Now, the thing I'm gonna mention about this is that from a practical point of view, um, <clears throat> at least in my experience, uh, I don't run across needing to know the details of subsumption um, to write some, uh, some good 
concepts. And in general, um, I'm writing concepts that um, maybe are a little different than certain things, but I tend to use the standard library concepts uh, first where I can, because I know those have been well designed uh, and I know they've been vetted specifically uh, to, you know, worry about these problems. So the more I can use those concepts, um, uh, the better off I am. Um, and by the way, um, because I spend an unreasonable amount of time uh, looking at things like changes to the, the standard library uh, with concepts, um, it, it can get very complicated uh, in certain cases to understand all the overload resolution and so forth. So now when we're getting to the point of writing and designing the concepts, one of the things we got to ask ourselves is, you know, how are we finding these concepts in the first place? And what would I consider to be a good concept or a bad concept? Um, what I'm going to tell you on this slide is not necessarily my personal experience. Um, not that it, my personal experience goes against this. It's just the recommendations from, you know, people like Bjarne Strustrup and um, so forth that have been dealing with this, working with this a lot longer um, than I think most of us in terms of, you know, being able to have access to the tools and, and work on uh, a significant code base that includes concepts. Um, so, you know, one of the comments that's made is that, um, you know, the first uh, question is, you know, is a single operation kind of concept, is, is that a good concept? Uh, and generally, you know, it's probably not um, because you're just specifying that this thing has one uh, particular operation. So let's take Addable as an example. Um, that's likely not really what you're looking at. You're probably talking about whether or not the thing is a number because um, you're probably thinking operator plus. Now, sure, it could be the case that, you know, maybe there's some other types that you would want to consider uh, in that group, but do you want to consider bool as part of addable? Because you can say plus on bool. Uh, do you want char there? So it's probably not the case that you're going to get necessarily the type set that you're really interested in with a single operation concept. So, you know, the claim is that good concepts are really uh, going to typically come from the algorithms that you're writing. And those algorithms are going to drive the needs. But do we just do the minimal set of the concept um, that is just what, you know, the few algorithms maybe that we're writing need? Or do we do something that's a little bit more domain-based in terms of looking at um, what the analysis of the domain would be and come up with uh, a set of concepts that would make set in the uh, make sense in the domain. So, um, you know, the argument essentially is that you know if you look at a domain like numbers or containers, you'll see that these operations come in groups. Um, so you're going to typically on numbers have plus minus multiply. On containers, you'll have stuff like insert, erase, and iteration. So it's not really the case that um, a single function type of concept is generally a good concept. Still, um, even with all of that, now we have the, still this remaining question, this nagging question um, of how we did find uh, the concepts. Hold on, we got a question. Um, uh, for good versus bad concepts, would you distinguish between concepts that are good for use by library users? or those that are good for building more complex concepts. Uh, defining a number of concept in terms of addable or multipliable concept, uh, negatable, yeah. So that's a good question. And I think um, I think it's a valid question. Uh, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Uh, I can definitely see the um, nice properties that you get by uh, defining smaller concepts that then uh, you know roll up into a larger named concept. The only thing there is maybe you don't need um, <clears throat> those smaller concepts as much, um, you know. So maybe it doesn't it doesn't make sense, um, you know, to to actually define those as full concepts. Uh, if you look at some of the standard library concepts, in, in particular, if you look at like totally ordered, for example, you know what you'll see is it actually defines all of the operations in one construct constraints or uh, uh, requires expression. Um, so it doesn't 
make those into, you know, it doesn't make like, uh, well, equality comparable actually is a separate concept because that one says, oh yes, I only have equal, equal and not equal. Um, but the other rest of it, you know, greater than, greater than equal, all of those come together uh, and they're not separated. So, uh, so I'm not gonna claim that I know the answer to that question. Um, and in this whole section, I'm not gonna claim that I know the answers to everything. Okay, uh, let's see, we got another question here. What happens if there are two specializations uh, where neither subsumes the other, uh, such that there, uh, such as if there were two type traits that were true and the compiler can't tell they're related. You're gonna get ambiguity in an overload set uh, as a general rule. Um, so uh, yeah, you're gonna have problems. And uh, I can tell you that once again, the standard library concepts are, written uh, carefully. Um, so writing concepts is, is definitely harder than using them. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's a bit of an art form, I think, at this point. And I think since we don't have very many people in the world that have actually had a lot of deep experience using the tooling, I think we don't know what all of the answers, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, pulling together those things are. Okay, um, hopefully that answered that question. All right, good questions. So let's let's move on a little bit to this issue of how do we find concepts and how do we how do we you know deal with getting to a place? And I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey that I went on myself uh, in an attempt to use uh, concepts um, <clears throat> in a domain that I'm fairly familiar with. So, um, but one of the points I'm going to make right now is that. Uh, and I kind of made this in the first session as well, that um, you're not likely to get the concepts that you want for your domain, which are probably going to be multi-type concepts that are all interacting together. It's unlikely that you're going to get them right. Um, I can tell you from the experience of watching the ranges proposal and reading the 287 pages of it, um, that the concepts were not right. Uh, they weren't right for two and a half years. Um, Eric Niebler and some of the other very smart people that worked on that um, couldn't get them right on their first attempt. So it's going to have iteration. And so if you're going to start using concepts in production code or, you know, um, for real, realize that you're probably going to get it wrong the first, second, tenth time. I'm not sure how many times it's going to take, quite honestly. Um, and we're gonna see when we go through this example that there's trade-offs here. It's not as simple as just saying, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. Um, so uh, we'll see this as, as we go on. So the example I'm gonna use is the sleep for function uh, that comes from C++11. Um, and this function is in STD chrono. Uh, and it's a very simple thing, right? I mean, this is a single function and it takes a duration type or it takes a time point type. Um, <clears throat> and those two types are defined as part of chrono. So what I'm gonna to attempt to do here though, is I'm going to refactor um, the sleep for function in particular um, to a concept to see what we can do. Um, because I have this secondary motivation, which is that I wanna use other time types here besides chrono time types here. I want to use uh, boost date time, for example. Uh, you know, I want to be able to use these other types. And I think I can do this with a concept, right? So if I have two types that will support the concept, I should be able to do. So I'm not going to talk much more about this. Um, but the thing I'll say is that Chrono itself, even though it's not written in terms of concepts, uh, does derive from concepts that were derived very early on uh, in Boost Date Time and then in other libraries and Howard's library eventually, where we took uh, this concept of a time duration and we said, look, here's a whole bunch of instances of this concept. Uh, but of course, we only had type machinery um, to use at that time to specify things. So when we get down to the sleep for method itself, it's not defined currently in terms of a concept, it's defined in terms of a concrete type. All right, so 
like how does the API work? If you haven't seen this, I'm sure most of you have seen this. You call, you know, thread sleep for, you know, with a, a time, uh, it could be a millisecond, a nanosecond, seconds, and so forth. So you can pass these different uh, uh, resolutions of time into sleep for. Uh, so you're already saying to yourself, even though from a user's point of view, there doesn't look like there's anything here, there are actually templates under this hood. Um, and if we dig in and we actually look at what is the signature for sleep for, this is what it is. Um, so I have a representation class, I have a period class, and I have a duration that takes those two parameters um, and on the Intel side uh, with the time point, which is really a different concept, I have a clock and I have a duration. So I already have, you know, three independent types, four independent types uh, going on in just this one simple or two simple calls. Um, so there's a lot of sophistication uh, in terms of this. Now, what's the problem here? You know, I can't send my boost time in there, even though if I look at what boost has, it's morally exactly the same, right? I mean, I can write exactly that same code, uh, but it won't work with sleep for. So, you know, that's because Chrono has a grip on this. We have to use Chrono types in this interface. We have no choice um, because that's the way it's written. All right. So, you know, the first thing I did is say, well, <clears throat> how do I get some requirements for these types if I want to refactor this interface uh, to concepts? You know, how would I actually, you know, go about that task itself? Uh, and so, you know, the obvious thing to do is open up the Sleep4 implementation and take a look at it. Here's what it actually looks like. Um, and now I can see how the parts of the chrono typing are actually being used. So let's go through it a little bit. So first of all, I have um, this parameter, which is underscore, 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 whatever, our time. Um, and the first thing right out of the box, um, this thing in sleep war says, oh, uh, if my relative time, that's my you know time duration, compared to zero is less than or equal to zero, just return. So right off the bat, I have a function called dot zero uh, that has to exist on that duration type. Uh, and I have to have a comparison operation. Um, so there's two things uh, right off the bat. Then I can see next, I have uh, this duration cast. So I'm able to cast uh, uh, this actual relative time. I'm able to cast the seconds part of this out into a variable called s. And then I'm able to cast the, or get the nanoseconds remaining out of this by taking the relative time and subtracting uh, the number of seconds um, uh, out of it. Uh, and that gives me the remaining nanoseconds. And why are we doing all of this? Well, we're doing this so simply we can um, get it into this thing called time spec. Uh, so time spec is the, uh, C API way of specifying a time specification um, and feel fortunate that we don't specify our times in terms of time spec. That almost happened in, in uh, C++ 11, but um, it didn't. Uh, instead, we have uh, something that's much more clear. But in any case, um, so you can see it's static casting to a time T here, uh, this S dot count. So that's the seconds part of it here and then the nanoseconds. So now I've identified yet another thing here, which is I need this count uh, operation to come out of a duration. And what does the count operation do? All it does is it gives me an integer-like type um, and that integer-like type represents the actual count relative to the particular kind of uh, duration it is. Okay, and then uh, a, you know the call to nanosleep here uh, you know, is the implementation detail, but it has no requirements on our time itself. So let's take stock. Um, a zero member function that returns a zero value. By the way, that's actually a static member function, despite the way it was written there. Um, a comparison operator, less or equal, ability to cast and retrieve the milliseconds and the seconds out of it. 
Um, and then we have this count function that we can cast either to a long uh, or a time t. So not too terrible. Um, <clears throat> so how would we start writing a concept then? Well, fine, um, pretty straightforward, really. Um, so the first decision you know I've made with relative to the good concept, bad concept is, should the time duration just have a less than equal function? Well, it seems not, because really if you go back and you look at what Chrono and Boost and other time libraries do for these kind of things, they're going to be totally ordered because these things are simple, right? They're basically counts. Um, and so it makes total sense that the time duration type would have to be totally ordered. So we take out totally ordered uh, and then we and, and we've got a couple of additional things here. We've got our count and our, our zero that we identified. And for this, I'm going to ignore the casts. Um, and the other conversions just for the moment anyway, um, just to make this a little bit simpler. Um, so that's my first, you know, cut, uh, you know, at, at writing a time duration concept that works. So now I can, you know, test that concept like I was showing you in the first section. And indeed, you know, Chrono succeeds. It's totally ordered. It has count and zero exactly as I would expect since that works with that API. So there's another little problem um, here that isn't obvious at all, um, <clears throat> but I happen to know about this problem. So this rep type um, um, and the rep type that goes into Chrono, um, most of the time we think about that, you know, if we talk about seconds or nanoseconds, we talk about that as an integer type. Uh, but as it turns out, Chrono allows you to have a floating point representation here. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a fan of it, honestly, but it is what it is. So it can happen. And so in point of fact, there's another problem here, which is that honestly, this isn't going to really work right if I send in a floating point type. Um, and I believe actually there was a LWG issue about this and ultimately put in some wording that says, yeah, don't send a floating point type into this API. But really I'd like to be able to do better, right? Like I'd be, like to be able to say, look, if you try to compile this thing with a floating point representation, um, that's not something that's going to work. Um, so if I go back down, uh, now I can easily do that, right? Like I can simply say not a floating point type. Um, if I look at the representation type, for the duration type itself, um, which is, uh, you know, saying as part of this concept now, I'm not saying it in the expression clause anymore. I'm saying it right here in this constraint that D is gonna have to have a type called rep. And I'm going to have to be able to say that that's not a floating point type. So now I've actually been able to test uh, that that's that, and I can uh, avoid that constraint. I'm not gonna talk about this more, but you can see kind of the evolution of how we can say now in a first class way, yeah, you know, Chrono gives you this facility where you can have these duration types that you can, um, you know, have floating point internal representations for, for whatever it is that you wanna do. Uh, but by the way, when we get back down to, you know, uh, 2011 in the operating system and we need to do timing stuff with Chrono and that's the only use of it, then we are actually gonna throw you out if you actually have a floating point type. So I think you know that's actually a way to enforce the constraint of the sleep for API in a way that's valuable. Um, and yeah, it tells you at compile time that it's not going to work. Um, so of course this one satisfies that constraint because the uh, type alias is for seconds, um, you know, of course are defined in terms of integer types. All right, so now, now I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna keep the simplified version of the first cut with the totally ordered and, and zero for the next part. So I just, you know, explained that floating point part saying, yes, I can not and exclude. Oh, actually, I actually forgot to say that. Um, maybe I, I threw this at you, which um, wasn't seen before, uh, maybe in examples, this word not in front, of course, means the same thing. I, I could put the exclamation 
here or you know the bang if you want to call it that uh, and that would be the same thing so i've knotted that actual part of the con the constraint uh, in this case the type trait okay so um so fine i'm back to my simplified version here's my first cut at actually writing a function um, so my function overload is now written in time duration auto uh, as you would expect uh, and uh, I'm going to cheat now because I'm lazy. And so this first test I'm doing is just with the chronotypes to make sure that I can, you know, make this work. Uh, and so I'm actually just going to use, uh, instead of lifting the implementation out of, you know, GCC's land and rewriting it here, I'm just using the, the standard sleep four for the moment so I can build up uh, and test the pieces uh, as I go. Okay, so far so good. So now let's take a look at boost. Um, and, you know, so uh, got a question. So should the time duration concept enforce the existence of D rep before uh, up, uh, applying the standard is floating point type name? Um, the answer is it doesn't need to because it's implied. Um, so, so this actually uh, is implying that that has to be true, and, and uh, the compiler is actually able to unpack that just fine. Um, it looks like uh, forbidding floating point makes sense for sleep four, but it's poss possibly over overly specific for something called um, uh, time duration. Uh, there are many applications where domains for floating point time duration make sense, physics simulation, right? Uh, exactly, that's why we have it actually because the physics community insisted. Um, and uh, do you think you might have overspecified the concept? Absolutely. Um, and so there may be a different way to do this, right? Um, in specific, I could keep the time duration uh, itself without this floating point constraint, and I could only constrain the sleep for function. Um, so I think that actually is probably the superior design. So, really excellent question there. Um, and yeah, I actually kind of backed off and took this out um, because, yeah, I had the same question about, is that really the right thing, given that I can't constrain everything else with respect to the time duration? So this is this part about designing with concepts that's hard, right? Um, is it fundamental that, you know, duration uh, is not a floating point type. It's not actually, right? Because we've already said we have instances there are. So yeah, I think I think uh, that's a very good point. All right. So all right, so going back to you know what happens with boost. Um, so now I've got my time duration thing um, and I try this with boost and of course, uh, boost doesn't have the same form. Uh, sorry, this actual, uh, this one I didn't uh, format for the slide, but you can see what's happening here. Required satisfaction of time duration. Uh, you know, this expression V dot count does not exist. V dot zero does not exist. So I've run to the point where now, um, you know, I violated the constraints, uh, but the good news is uh, at least by doing this now, it's kind of telling me what I need. Uh, I think if I would have just tried to put, well, I know when I put boost in sleep four, uh, it's not going to give me an error message that's nearly this clear. So um, anyway, it's you know pretty clear what's going on. So repeating from part one, uh, it's clear that the error messages are better. So at this point, I'm kind of at a crossroads. Um, so, you know, what are my options for, for making this happen? So obviously one option is I can go change boost to meet the concept. Um, and that would be the obvious thing to do. Um, I can also do something, you know, that I didn't say before, which is I could just make a conversion operator from the boost durations to the chrono durations, right? Uh, I didn't have to go through this whole concept route, uh, but I went through the concept route because I was curious about whether or not this was the right way to go. 
I have a third option uh, for my design. And um, if if I really, you know, went and modified Boost to meet the concepts, uh, that probably would be a good thing, right? Like it probably would be a help perhaps to Boost users that have Boost right now. Uh, and eventually we'll use, you know, uh, Chrono in C++ 20, um, you know, so they would get access potentially to those standard features. They're not that hard to write. Um, so definitely could do that. Um, the duration cast, I think, becomes a problem. Uh, so I think the way the Sleep 4 is currently written wouldn't actually work. So I'm going to have to pull that Sleep 4 code out and I'm going to have to refactor it a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to have to change my concept again. So there's another option here, um, which is I can refactor the concept a little bit uh, and I can make it all work um, without getting into either the standard library um, or the boost library. And I can get what I want out of it by sort of cheating. Um, now, is it the best design? I'll let you judge. So the first step in this journey is now to say, I'm going to separate my concept into sort of two different parts. Uh, the first part I'm interested in is this, this whole idea of accessor methods. So I still have my same exact uh, requires expression here with the count and the zero, um, and I'm calling that time duration access. So now I've just pulled it together uh, in a simple refactoring. Everything is still good. It still works, no problem. Uh, and now <clears throat> I'm going to actually change the name of that duration access, and I'm going to, to actually have two different concepts. And so this kind of goes to the question from before, to sort of, uh, you know, are there some steps where maybe we want to build a partial concept that uh, maps only one part of the situation? And the answer is maybe. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I think it works pretty well. Um, so I, I create something called standard time duration access. So, so this is how the access works for you know, the standard library. Um, but then I have a different one for boost. And basically the way you get the same information you need out of boost um, as calling total milliseconds. And actually there are some problems here. So, uh, but I'm going to breeze over those problems. I'm sure somebody will call me on them later. Um, but now I can rewrite my time duration concept and I can say, look, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, they've all got to be totally ordered, but I'm going to allow you to have two different access types. Um, you can either have, you know, uh, standard time duration access, or you can have boost uh, access. So I'll be flexible. I'll, I'll allow you to do either. And now I can write my sleep for like this. Um, so as mentioned, is, if const expert uh, is perfectly capable of evaluating uh, and then uh, instantiating essentially only one uh, branch of this uh, code uh, during it. So I now have my sleep for in terms of time duration uh, concept, and I have the first branch, which is standard time duration access, and I have the second branch, um, which is uh, boost time duration access. Uh, and I'm still cheating. I'm still using standard. Uh, and basically all I did here was I, you know, uh, tricked boost into converting into standard chrono. Uh, but what's interesting here is I haven't touched either library, right? Um, I haven't modified either library. I'm just using them. And now I've written a version of sleep for that integrates the two together and works perfectly well. So, huh. Interesting. So is that the best design? Is it the right design? It's a refactored design that allows me to do this in a very short amount of code um, that doesn't touch either of the two fundamental libraries. So it has some really nice properties, right? What properties doesn't it have? Well, one property it certainly doesn't have is I can't just add you know, some extra new time library in here without going and modifying the sleep for yet again with another if const expert. But if my only goal is to integrate and have availability of sleep for for these two libraries, I would argue this might actually be the best solution. Um, and I've used concepts to do it. Um, the code is very clean and clear. Um, I think anybody can basically understand it. 
Um, and so I think it has very uh, good properties. So final thoughts on this. Um, I think even this simple example, you know, sort of demonstrates that, um, you know, this is not something that's, you know, super simple to do. Um, you know, even within, you know, five minutes of my presentation, there were questions about, yeah, does the floating point thing really count? Should you really put that in? So you have to make a lot of design decisions. Now, that's the right thing, right? I mean, we want to make those design decisions because we want to understand uh, how our program operates. So I do think it's a good thing. And I think the thought process and the experimentation are very good. One of the really nice things about concepts here is it's really easy to do the experiments. Like you can put this in the God Bowl and just do the experiments. It's not difficult at all because it doesn't require a lot of, uh, a lot of work. So um, that, you know, Doing a static assert and seeing whether something actually uh, matches the concept is very fast and light. Um, so you can do that experiment relatively quickly. So uh, we have a question, um, but can you achieve the exact same thing with function overload um, uh, uh, referring to sleep for? Yes, I could have written it with function overload um, and that would have been a different way to do it. Um, so yes. I could use the old school way to do it, but I think there are some substantial advantages to doing it this way. Uh, again, in particular, because one of the things I'm thinking about here is one of the things that going forward, what's going to happen to libraries and C++ going forward? And I feel like refactoring to concepts may very well become a promising way to get libraries to evolve. Um, and so, um, you know, when I look at, you know, something like, uh, Chrono and the way it's designed today, I can totally see that we could open Chrono up uh, in ways to types that don't come from Chrono specifically. Um, and I think that would actually, you know, be of a substantial benefit potentially. Uh, so if you can imagine, you know, there's a lot of territory that Chrono can never cover. Like it, it can't cover, you know, specialized calendars and other kinds of types. Uh, potentially. So, you know, maybe being able to refactor some of the interfaces uh, in a way that allows those other types to work would be a very valuable thing for the community. Because from a client's point of view, what it means is, you know, they can use and extend um, the, the concept. So, uh, so we're getting a comment in the chat. Uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the positive thoughts. Um, so refactoring the concepts, will this become a thing? I don't know. Um, it might. Uh, I think it's certainly something that's uh, worthwhile of exploring. And now in this last section, we're gonna go up yet another level in design thinking. Um, uh, there's another question. Could this be called a, a form of static polymorphism? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Stay tuned. Uh, because now we're going to talk about um, the fundamentals of what we're doing here, right? Like, what is design anyway, right? Uh, so what's the next question is, how abstract should concepts be? For example, it seems that focusing on somewhat on implementation details, like I just cheated and did, um, uh, for sleep work, uh, conversion, right. So, and I'm wondering if a higher level concept, like can this duration be converted to a specific type, like time spec be useful? Uh, Chris, you're a great straight man. Uh, I actually forgot to say that. That might actually be the right concept, right? Because really the question for calling nano sleep, right, is can I get a time, you know, time spec out of it? That's really what the implementation needs. So maybe that really should be what the concept is and maybe that should only apply to the sleep four function. Uh, it doesn't have to, you know, apply to the time duration type uh, itself. So we can combine the concepts uh, on a constrained function with the concepts that maybe we want for time duration uh, to get to the useful behavior. Thank you, good question. So now I'm gonna roll back and I'm gonna argue um, that we don't know what we're talking about when we talk about software design. I mean, we do know what we're talking about, we just don't talk about it coherently. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to argue uh, that we've actually known 
most of what we know about software design for 25 to 30 years. I mean, I already showed you that concepts as an idea uh, has been around for a very long time. It's nothing new. Um, so, you know, we've got all of these things that we talk about in terms of design, right? Um, we talk about paradigms, right? We have, you know, C++ supporting, you know, like structured paradigms and functional and generic and object-oriented paradigms. But what, like, really what's behind these paradigms? So, yeah, they're different. They have different precepts, different things, um, <clears throat> you know, that, are going on in terms of how we separate the concerns of the program in these different paradigms. But are they really that different in the end? Um, what's the real fundamental issue that leads us to um, you know, various kinds of design? So let's talk about the design principles that we see around, right? So, you know, uh, I really like, you know, the dry wet principle, uh, you know, so it feels like that one's pretty fundamental, right? I mean, we don't want to repeat our code in any way, shape or form, right? We want to write it once and use it many, many times. That's fundamental to generic design for sure. Um, but yeah, I like the other side of it is write everything twice. Um, that's not a totally invalid thing. You see a lot of it in practice, unfortunately. And now I'm going to get stepped into the land of the keynote for tomorrow, but uh, um, I'm going to cover this very quickly. I mean, the first you know joke I'm going to make here is that like if you use solid, you're a very principled person, right? Because every single one of these ends with principle. So since they're principles, obviously they should be followed, right? Like the naming of the thing makes it so it's obvious that each one of these things is real and true uh, and so forth. Uh, I think that we're gonna find out um, that there are some troubles here, right? Like, are these solid principles really based on, you know, some kind of fundamental mathematical logic of things? Um, <clears throat> you know, let's take single responsibility. So, you know, you're going to write a function that has, or a type that has a single responsibility. What exactly does that mean? Um, you know, uh, can you point out, like, is it, you know, what's one thing? Because one thing, you know, okay, sure, get, you know, my data member. Sure, that's one thing. It's a single responsibility. So I think it's a little hard to pin down in a lot of cases what an actual single responsibility is. Um, looking at some of these other ones, we have, you know, a lot of discussion here, right, about um, dependency. So dependency inversion, uh, open closed, right? So open to extension, closed to modification. So that's talking about, sure, we want to be able to extend, we need to be able to add something in, but we don't want to change the abstraction, right, that we're dependent on. And by the way, I'm giving you the five second version of what these things mean, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, that's funny, uh, comment in the chat, um, <clears throat> what wet actually means. Um, so Liskov substitution. Well, I'm gonna talk about that one a little bit more because I feel like Liskov is onto something here. Uh, and I feel like that one is one that you might be able to justify, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, in terms of some some foundational thought, um, but you know maybe not. And of course, kiss right. Like so, sure. You know we want our design to you know model Occam's razor, but you know come on, this is the real world. We we have complicated programs, right? I mean, why do we have these design principles anyway? Right. The reason that we have design principles is because we have to decompose monolithic programs into something smaller, better that we can read, we can test, we can separate parts of it, right? I mean, this is the fundamental problem. This is the fundamental problem that all of the designs have, is we don't want to write one monolithic thing that does the entire functionality of the program, because it's brittle. It's impossible for us to actually reason about it. Uh, we can't test it uh, reasonably. One of my favorite actual you know, academic studies of all time. It was back in the 80s, I think it was done. Um, <clears throat> it was mostly before there was even object-oriented programming or anything. So they're looking at, you know, functions in C and functions in, uh, in Fortran, for example. And they're basically saying, look, in this functional decomposition, once a program 
is above a certain size. And I believe the size is approximately 120 lines of code, somewhere in there. Um, once it gets above a certain size, it never is modified. Like it's a, it's a frozen iceberg that never changes. Um, and it was interesting. So why, why would that, that monolithic function never change? Well, it's because of these things that we're looking at right here. I mean, in modern software development, we're not gonna write a hundred line function, right? Um, we're gonna write, you know, 10 smaller functions that can be tested and reasoned about, uh, that we can read and understand. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, modern software development. Um, back in that day, there might've been a few excuses for writing those more monolithic functions uh, in that that wasn't penalty free necessarily. The compilers were not as good uh, at, you know, alighting the cost of calling a function as they are today. Uh, inline functions were not a thing uh, when that paper was written. So the fundamental thing though, right, is decomposition, divide it up and then break it into some manageable parts. So as soon as we do that, as soon as we divide that monolith up, what happens? Well, we have to recompose that program, right? The divided program has dependencies now on other things. So one function depends on another function, a type depends on another type. Um, so let's see, me refactors 10K function <laughs> into three 5K line functions. <laughs> uh, yeah, funny. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, if you've ever been faced with uh, in production, uh, having to refactor a large function. Um, but the, the interesting observation, by the way, of that study really was that it almost never happened, right? Like they were actually looking at uh, data from industry, um, you know, that once that function was written that way, they wouldn't change. And what would happen is basically copy and paste of the subpart when something needed to change and the appearance of a new smaller function that replicated part of the function. And now that, so that, that big function was frozen and it was also dying, slowly dying a death as copy and paste took the parts of the function off to somewhere else. Uh, but no one could figure out uh, how it was. All right, so once I've torn that monolith apart, Right. Once you've refactored that fun that 10k function into something smaller, well, now you've probably made the parts depend on each other somehow. By the way, when that study was made, refactoring wasn't a thing. Um, it wasn't something that was talked about. So, what's the problem with divided programs? Well, now we have these dependencies, and of course, we all know that as soon as we get a cycle in the graph of dependencies, um, you know that it's bad. We're codependent. It's a big ball of mud again, uh, and we can, you know, charge thousands of dollars to point this out in code bases and, uh, you know, make a fortune, right? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's it's the case that a lot of what we're really talking about now is we've divided up that program and we want to care about how the dependencies are set up, right? When we're depending on an abstraction, the idea of that is it's going to be uh, that abstraction is actually going to not change very much, right? Like that's the idea. So divided programs need to be recomposed. So we have to put the parts back together. We have to understand the dependencies. Um, and that's what most of those principles that we looked at before are really about. So now let's talk about concepts and dependencies. So clearly, right, the goal here is that we're going to now want to move our dependencies from a concrete type, right, to an abstraction, which is a concept. Um, so that's really what we're going to do. We're going to shift it. So what are the effects of shifting uh, our abstraction from a design point of view, our dependency to that concept? Well, you know, it's simple and easy to test. We've shown that over and over again. Um, so that's nice. We can tell whether or not our type meets the concept, meets the abstraction. Um, <clears throat> it's a little disturbing that we can't still sort of obviously see it. Like it's not like written in the program in an obvious way that static assert is about really the only leverage we have. But in another way, we've actually just shifted the problem, right? Like, you know, now we have a concept and we can say a type model is a concept. Um, but if we evolve that concept, working code can now fail just as easily as it could if we evolved a type. And the other way applies too, right? Like now we have two things. We have the concept that can change and we have the types that can change. And if we change the type sufficiently, it will no longer uh, compile and uh, model a concept. So something that might've been working before will no longer work. 
So, okay, um, the good news about it is that your program won't compile and you'll get a decent error message. So that's the good news. That first part though, about changing the concept. Um, and if you don't sit in standard library meetings and, and listen to the conversation, that has a dramatic effect on the design of the standard library. Um, the thinking in the committee, in the library evolution group is, once a concept is there, it can never change. And that's because we could break everybody's code that depends on that concept downstream. So that's, that's a huge high bar, right? Like that is a bar that is uh, literally almost unattainable to get that concept perfect and never change it for the next 20 years. Um, and we also know that we've also already failed in doing this. Uh, if we weren't, you know, sending papers into C++ 23 right now to back change C++ 20, uh, we might be able to say that, yes, we got all the concepts in C++ 20 right. We didn't. We got some of them wrong. And we're changing them now before it gets into production code um, at, at risk. Um, some people have probably written some production code with GCC and are going to be unpleasantly surprised to remember that actually it says, by the way, these implementations are still experimental. Um, so that is a, a feature of this domain. Now, once we get our concepts right though, um, and, and one of the other questions you have to ask is how frequently is the concept going to evolve versus how frequently is a type going to evolve? And I think the answer there is that um, a good well-written concept is less likely to evolve uh, than a type is going to evolve. So at least we've gotten a little bit of mileage uh, from the concept. For sure, if we change the internal private data member structure of a type, um, the concept is unaffected. Uh, and so that part, it's definitely a win. So I'm going to call this a mixed bag. I can't project every project and how their types and their concepts lay out. Um, but I think there's definitely some advantage to the dependency on concepts as opposed to types. So let's now talk about another area. So in the first part of the presentation, um, uh, let's see, we got a question before I go on. Is it true that the immu immutability of published concepts is the reason the standard can say, contains exposition only concepts so they can change without breaking code. Uh, that's absolutely 100% the case. Um, the committee is being extremely uh, conservative about introducing new concepts. And so yes, every time you see exposition only concept, yeah, the code that was uh, the progenitor of it was written in terms of an actual concept in um, you know, the implementation. Uh, but the reality is that um, they're saying to you, yeah, this is an interesting concept, but we're not going to give it to you to use in your code because there's a possibility or we're unsure at this point whether we might break that at some point down the line. So yes, Chris, that's exactly correct. Um, and good question. Um, so let's now talk a little bit about readability and evolvability from a client perspective, right? So we've had auto now for some time and We've had various uh, design conversations, I guess I'll call it, you know, almost always auto, almost never auto. Uh, we could probably get into a long debate about which is the right thing. But let's just look at it objectively for a second, right? If I write this first line of code here, auto result, some function, um, what does it mean? Well, it means I, I, like I can't tell what the return type here is. It's saying I totally don't care what this return type is. It's very flexible. Because if some function changes, I mean, I still have to recompile my code if some function changes the return type. Um, but you know, my code will go long for the ride. And as long as whatever I do below here doesn't violate whatever implicit constraints there are in the type that's returned from some function, then it'll continue to function just fine. So it's given me some evolvability without actually having to refactor code. But I also don't like it because I just don't know what it is. Uh, unless some function is something obvious, like, you know, get an iterator from a container where it's so blatantly obvious, maybe I don't care. Um, so fine. So if I write the second line of code, now I've pinned it down to an int. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it's obvious now, but now it's brittle, right? Because if the type turns to a long 
from some function and from an int for some reason, now my int is gonna overflow potentially and I've created a bug. And C++ of course is horrible for this. Um, but you know, it's brittle in the sense that even if I get a compile error, you know, every time I change the sum function thing, right? So this is the thing I'm dependent on, right? My code, my client code depends on some function to produce something. And when I produce that result, um, you know, it'll be brittle if I pin down exactly what it is. So concepts gives us this intermediate ground now where I can say, here's my concept uh, and my result. And it means that I can see what it is um, in a flexible way or in a clear way, but it's also flexible, right? Like if I have multiple things that, um, you know, can model that concept, it's really defining a set of types, not a single type anymore. So now I have some uh, leverage here. And it means my client code might not have to evolve uh, if I've got my concepts uh, well-defined. Uh, and I can also see in my code what's actually going on. So this, this slide basically says everything I just said. <laughs> um, so there's nothing really new on, on this slide per, per se. Um, and so it's an interesting take though, right? I mean, from a design perspective of, of a client, uh, having that extra flexibility that concepts gives us is interesting. Um, it allows for some, I'll call it bounded evolution of client code without having to uh, actually modify code. Uh, you'll still have to compile it. Um, that's a given, um, but you won't have to necessarily change it. All right. So let's do a little bit deeper, you know, conversation about Liskov. Um, <clears throat> and I know everybody at C++ now knows completely what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure Tony is going to deconstruct this much more. So really what I'm going to talk about here is the 32nd version of Liskov. Uh, I'm not gonna go into it, but essentially uh, what Liskov is talking about is a principle that describes how we should use inheritance. And it's basically saying that subtypes need to have the same structure. I don't have that on the slide, but they need to have the same structure, right? Because you know, you're calling a base class function uh, on a type, uh, and then you're expecting the meaning of that function. Um, you know, as a client, you're expecting the meaning of the subclass implementation to be the same. Um, and so that's called substitutability, right? So this idea that we can substitute. So it's actually though two things, right? It's not just the structure. It's also the pre and post conditions of the base type. Like if the subtype asserts on zero uh, and causes the program to crash, that means it's not a valid subtype according to Liskov. Um, because presumably the pre and post conditions of the base type didn't allow you to assert zero. Uh, so that's not a well-formed program under this principle. So this idea of substitution though, um, I wanna be able to take one type and I wanna be able to substitute a more refined type, something that has uh, some slightly different um, behavior, uh, but uh, it has the same meaning. I think in a way that's really the same kind of thing that concepts are getting at here, right? Uh, when we say a type models a constituted, a concept, it means it can be substituted there, right? It means it's going to do that. Here's the problem. Concepts don't model preconditions and uh, post conditions. That's contracts. That's the feature that we didn't get. So um, as a result, um, you know, concepts don't give us everything we need uh, to prove substitutability at compile time, for example. So Still though, I feel like this idea of substitu uh, substitution of types um, is really pretty fundamental to um, the ideas of, of how we can uh, design and leverage these things for our design. Okay, and now in an unexpected twist, I'm going to roll you all the way back to 1972 as we step one more rung up the ladder. <clears throat> and this is where I'm going to you know, point out that I think most of the ideas that we have about how to structure uh, a program, you know, come from a very, very long time ago. Um, they aren't really new and modern. Um, 
and I bring out Parnas's paper because in structured programming, um, you know, if you ever studied that, um, you know, you would see that very early on back in the day, as soon as a program got bigger than <laughs> a very small program, um, you know, there's idea of being able to work on independent develop, to compose programs, to understand programs was already there. So if you go read the seminal paper, um, you know, uh, that was written in the ACM in 1972, it is online, it is linked at the end. Um, if you go read this thing, you'll see and recognize everything we recognize about, you know, how should we structure and pull apart pieces of a design and then put them back together. So here's some good examples, right? Like they're saying a data structure and its internal linkages uh, and procedures that modify it and access it should be part of one module. They talk about modules, which aren't C++ modules, of course. Um, it's actually just a general idea then, because really in 1972, they're mostly dealing with languages that just have functions. Um, and so they're thinking about, well, we could group these things together uh, in some fashion. Um, and we're only now just getting compilers that you know allow us to actually link things. So you can see in a lot of ways where you know the level of design thinking that you can even attain um, is influenced by the uh, implementation technology that you have. And so then the last one here, this last quote, you know the sequence of instructions necessary to call a given routine and the routine itself are part of the same module. And it's interesting because I think in 2021 and way before 2021, with the advent of generic uh, design and algorithms, the STL, um, we kind of broke that rule. Um, in fact, we kind of said, no, we really actually don't want that abstraction. We don't want it to be the case um, that everything that accesses a data structure actually has to be part of the data structure. Really what we want is an abstraction based on iterators or some other abstraction that allows us to go across the sequence uh, of a data structure. And that's really the design principle that we're working at. So when we see C++ 20 modules, we're looking at an abstraction that came from a long time ago, um, you know, uh, with iterators and ranges being a pull up of that abstraction um, to a new level. Uh, and those things actually go against the 1972 uh, design logic um, and what they were thinking the right structure of a program is. All right, so information hiding and concepts. So concepts, in a way, for information hiding ideas and the ideas expressed in the paper, uh, there's, a, again, there, a lot of this is still similar. It's still valid, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, we're hiding specifics like the type. Uh, we're hiding the storage. We're hiding things by using concepts uh, you know, in a design instead of using, in specifically the storage case, right? Like that storage thing is seeing a thing that's been part of C++ all along. You include that header file and, you know, unfortunately the type had to define everything. Um, you know, you didn't have a, a choice to separate it out uh, to an, a, a different kind of abstraction. So I think clearly for hiding the information details of a particular type, um, concepts is a win, no question about it. So we're allowing for type variation as well. Um, the algorithm and data structure part of it is also interesting in the sense that if you look at the way the C++20 uh, algorithms are set up, <clears throat> we have different kinds of ranges, right? Um, those ranges have different properties. So we have forward range or contiguous range and so forth. And why do we have those properties? Well, in part, we have those properties because we want to ensure better to the metal performance, the best possible performance. And again, if you look at Parnas's uh, rationale for why do we want to keep the data structure and the access algorithms together, it's because of this point. It's because the performance uh, of the algorithm over the data structure matters. But what have we been able to do now with concepts? Well, we've been able to take that idea, we've been able to take that abstraction and lift it into a Boolean predicate which we can now use to actually decide which version of an algorithm we're going to use, and we can specialize the version of an algorithm for it. So I think quite clearly, uh, Concepts is, is giving us something new. Uh, when I roll all the way back to this, um, it's giving us something new that we can use to actually get a level of uh, separation that wasn't possible in the past. 
So has anybody heard of uh, James Copeland? Um, <clears throat> maybe not. So we're going to roll forward to 1999 now. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm probably going to have to speed up just a little bit. But we're going to go back to 1999. And um, <clears throat> this quote, um, you know, was really quite a radical statement in 1999. Uh, any of you who were programming in C++ in 1999, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, CRTP, yep, <clears throat> I think he did invent that, uh, and uh, so forth. Um, but he also wrote this book called Multi-Paradigm Design, which if you've never seen this book, I actually recommend it. It's worth a read. Because, um, it, it, again, like I'm trying to do in this presentation, it really tries to dissect what it is that we're actually doing with software design. It's, it's really the questions that you, the hard questions that you need to ask. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it was worthy of a relook, or at least, uh, you know, I wanted to look at it. And yes, uh, Steve, you're correct that um, uh, he was heavily into the patterns community and the object-oriented community as well. Uh, so both. So the fact that he said that, you know, designs have non-trivial parts that are not object oriented at this time uh, was something radical. Now, of course, look, the STL already existed. So we had already shifted away from a point where we knew that there were other ways to design things. But really, the thesis of the book uh, is involved with how do we sort out this whole thing of talking about, um, you know, how do we how do we get down to where do we find the pattern right where do we find uh the concepts um and then basically you know i've captured a few key quotes right like good systems commonality captures mechanism and variability captures policy um so he actually looks at two different sides. He looks at the domain analysis side, you know, uh, what is it about the, you know, structures in the, in the domain itself from, you know, sort of analysis point of view. And then there's also the solution domain. And so what can we do in the solution domain? And in the solution domain, we're interested in what things, um, you know, commonality can be represented. So structure, name, behavior, algorithms. These are things that represent some commonality. Um, and he mentions that commonalities identify abstractions that will remain stable over time, which is exactly what we want in the dependency in the setup. So this is the key, right? We want those abstractions to be stable over time. We want our concepts to be stable over time. And he talks a lot about um, <clears throat> name and behavior commonality. And uh, <clears throat> obviously there's some committee members on this line listening, um, you know, naming and talking about naming, um, you know, are things that uh, we spend a lot of time on. Uh, we care about it a lot. And that's because those names convey meanings um, to clients and clients need to understand uh, those meanings to use programs pop properly. We're not at the point where, you know, we can compile the meaning into the program. In fact, I suspect we never will be. Um, until AIs take over our job, um, we won't have that. So um, he talks about this behavior versus meaning dichotomy that I mentioned earlier. So we have different behavior. So we have a variation, right? We have a variation in behavior, um, but it has the same meaning. So we want the same name for that because the behavior variation is really just a specialization, for example, that allows us to make this code more performant in the case of a range, for example, um, <clears throat> you know, that is, uh, uh, you know, contiguous range as opposed to uh, some kind of an input range. Now, Copeland doesn't talk about specialization uh, because it really wasn't a thing. Uh, at the time very much. Uh, compilers just really couldn't do uh, very much with templates comparatively to what they can do today. <clears throat> um, so the key here, right, is the meaning The meaning of the code. So that's a very abstract thing. Uh, the meaning is the same, even though the behavior is different. So he goes through and talks about how do we implement commonality and variability in a program? Um, and, you know, look, we're going to recognize these tools. The tools mostly are the same. Uh, the one new tool we now have is concepts. So that's the question. The commonality and variability, how can we implement them with concepts? And I think earlier in the presentation, I showed you a few different ways to do that. Specialization, 
uh, with concepts and so forth. You know, so that particular case in the standard library where we can take a function out of a base class, um, that's a negative variability where we've pulled uh, the ability of a client to actually even see that function for certain types. Um, but it allows us to keep that commonality of the base class of what it means to be a view in C++20, for example. So common things we've done for decades, we factor commonalities into a base class, um, we factor policies into traits classes. So uh, it was only like two years later uh, that the policy-based design idea came about and we have template parameters that represent policies, um, traits that are used uh, to specialize those templates uh, and so forth. I would also argue that value-oriented programming is a subtle uh, but important part of this as well in that now we use uh, these uh, common types that are vocabulary types as they're called routinely now, uh, those vocabulary types represent something common uh, that we do over and over again. And so we have a few types that just represent that and we can use those uh, over and over again in our programs uh, because they don't really change that much. Um, so it's fine to depend on those commonalities, right? That's what we want. We want to depend on the commonalities. So now it seems like we should be looking for commonalities to define concepts. That seems like a fundamental tenet of what we should be able to do. Um, but then we also are still looking for variations and then we can use the concepts as a way to create that variation. Uh, by the way, the preprocessor, which Copeland talks a lot about, um, doesn't go away in 2021. It's still there. Uh, ever look at any standard library, boost library, any kind of library that ports to multiple platforms, it's still there, hasn't gone away. Um, Sorry to say, um, as much as many people have loathed the preprocessor and want to get rid of it, I don't see it disappearing anytime soon. Okay, so multi-paradigm design and concepts ultimately. I think it's clear concepts express a set of types. Uh, if a type models a concept, then it's part of that set. We can use these sets. Uh, uh, the commonality of these sets uh, is the thing we can design to. Uh, negative variability can be expressed in terms of requirements um, uh, that can allow us to remove member functions. Um, and uh, we can do overloading, of course, as well, so we can keep the names the same, uh, even in the face of overloading. Uh, and then we can pull tricks with this if const expert, if we don't want to have that open design where we can extend it with a new concept at any time, uh, we can close it all off and put it uh, you know, safely away uh, in, into uh, one function that's divine in one place. And of course, the other thing that concepts, you know, sort of out of the box, because it defines a set of types, it sort of allows this positive variability idea because uh, even though a type can model a concept, it can have all sorts of behaviors and other things beyond what the concept actually, um, you know, uh, requires. And even further than that, one of the interesting things with the concept is we don't have to be 100% precise in the concept. Uh, in the first part of the session, I showed you output streamable that didn't check the return type as an O stream reference. And then later on, I showed you that, oh yes, we now actually are going to check that O stream reference. So, um, you know, it's the case that we can make that concept less uh, requirement, you know, less, uh, uh, we can we can allow some, some things in that allow positive variability into the case. All right. So I'm getting a little short on time. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through this pretty quick. But I also wanted to talk about one pattern. Um, because if we're thinking about this idea of refactoring libraries and designs, um, then we probably have to look at something, you know, that's a well-known thing. Um, and concepts uh, or serialization is something you know, that has evolved over time. And again, it just shows how the designs evolve over time, you know, with respect to uh, the technologies that are available. So the old design pattern was an object-oriented design with virtual functions only. Um, that's the way it was originally implemented if you went back to 1997 or 98. By the time you get to something like boost serialization, it's almost all templatized. You do have polymorphic ar archive types, um, but largely, you have two key abstractions. You have an archive type that encapsulates data formatting and uh, uh, device ideas um, uh, for input and output. 
So we have some variations even within this archive abstraction itself. Um, so we might have XML or JSON or a relational database, protobufs, whatever it is that we're streaming our data into. Um, we have an archive that encapsulates the details of that part, particular part of the design, right? We've separated the concerns of the serializable type, which are just types that you want to use in your program, right? They have encapsulated data uh, that they don't want to just export around, except for that when we do this serialization thing, we actually do have to export that data around. Um, and then there's this very interesting double dispatch that goes on between the archive type and the serializable type. Um, and on the input side, you have to have a type factory. Um, so there's some complications in this whole design. So what are some properties? Well, some properties are that, you know, it's really nice how the serializable types have their data encapsulated. They're not you know, spread all over the program. Uh, just because I want to do uh, JSON to tomorrow uh, the, means I, do, I don't have to know about that. I don't have to write any method on that type. It keeps that type closed to change, right? So back to that open close principle, right? Um, the archive format is also nicely encapsulated. It just knows about uh, fundamental types uh, and the serial serializable abstraction. Uh, so we've got a really nice separation of concerns going on here. So this is a standard example of what one looks like. I'm going to go fast past this slide. Um, but basically, in the type itself, you just write a serializable member function. The modern ones like Serial and, and Boost, you know, all use this kind of uh, pattern where, you know, it's a template mem mem member function with an archive type. Um, and then the archive type has, you know, an output archive looks something like this. You put a string value. Uh, for the name, and you have, uh, um, you know, the data that goes into it. So what are some problems here? So we no longer, in the modern version of this, we don't have any base types. We can't derive from them necessarily. The document is the only way we can figure out how to write a new archive type. Uh, if you've ever tried to write an archive type for one of these things, yeah, uh, it's not easy. Um, <clears throat> the compile errors are terrible. Um, you know, uh, external uh, extensions uh, are also needed for things like STD vector, right? So we actually have to have a second way to do this because we can't internally modify uh, STD vector. So those are some of the problems that we have with this whole idea. So what if we conceptified this? What if we actually created serializable and archive and output archive and all the various concepts associated with it? Would we benefit? Would this work? And I think it's clear it would be better um, because I think it would give us the leverage to say, okay, what does an output archive really have to do? What does an input archive have to do? Um, it would allow us to factor out uh, subtler policies like archives with order, archives without order, um, devices and files and other things might become policies um, that could be represented. So, and we can use the template aliasing and other techniques. All right, so conclusions and resources. Um, I've ended with just about seven minutes. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I'll just say one, a couple more words about design. Hopefully, hopefully this presentation has, you know, uh, made you think deeply about your designs, how you do them, how you find your abstractions, um, and you'll go off and use concepts to uh, to benefit and profit, um, you know, in that world. So then we have to ask this: Are concepts everything we really want? Um, <clears throat> and I think the clear answer is no. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of holes, I identified some of them, um, but I didn't go into things like customization points, tagging invoke, uh, all these details of modern generic design. Um, and I think Barry uh, Revson has written really the best uh, paper about this uh, where, and I think actually he might've given a presentation yesterday, which I wasn't able to see where he talks about Rust. Actually, he's talking about Rust at this conference a lot. Um, so uh, I don't know if Barry is there, but <laughs> I don't think Barry's in this session, but, um, <clears throat> you know, so there's a comparison of what Rust can do against what C++ can do. And some of what, you know, Rust can do was in the C++ OX concepts that got rejected uh, in C++ 11. Um, but there's more here that we can do. And the main issue with the modern generic design um, is it's not as clear, uh, it's not as obvious to the users of abstractions, uh, maybe some of the things uh, that they need to do 
to meet with those abstractions. So read 2279 if you want to extend your thinking about how design is done, what design means, and what it is in 2021 uh, with C++. So final thoughts. I think it's uh, a powerful new tool. Uh, adoption is going to take time, right? Like, you know, this is like the first shot across the bow where we have this. I think best practices are going to take more time as well. And hopefully, again, I've motivated you to uh, explore the space, even if you're just going to use concepts. Okay, we've got a question here. Uh, how do I define a concept like container never invalidates iterators when inserting? Uh, how can I overload on whether a type provides a contract? So the second part, uh, the contract part of it, yeah, without you know contracts in the language, um, you're not going to be able to do anything with contracts at this point. Um, I suppose you could make some kind of uh, traits in direction or something that would maybe give you an idea that the contract holds, but you know, you're not really going to be able to do it, I don't think. Um, <clears throat> how would I define a concept like container never? Uh, yeah, so um, you know, invalidating iterators as a as a you know, is it is it a trait? It's a trait of the container, perhaps. Um, and yeah, you could roll that into a concept somehow. Uh, so maybe that would be something. You know, if we actually went and modeled um, containers in the standard library, um, maybe we would see uh, concepts like that. So we could use uh, that in some fashion. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I think to step back on it, you'd have to ask the question, why do you want that concept? Why do you want to know that concept? What about the abstractions in your program mean that I would do some positive or negative variation as a result of the container and what it does when iterators are invalidated? Um, that's the question I would ask myself uh, if I was thinking about that. Hopefully that sort of answered the question. It's not a definitive answer, of course. Okay, do we have any other questions um, from the audience? Any other thoughts? Hopefully that was a lot. Uh, if somebody wants to raise their hand and talk, I'd be more than happy to take a question that way. No? Everybody's so lost. <laughs> um, Okay, we got another question here. Um, when concepts are in generic code, we may also like to generate uh, change concepts in templates. Should they be first class citizens? Um, there is some conversation about this uh, idea. Uh, once again, I'm trying to remember who wrote this paper. Um, but yeah, you can't plug a concept in uh, as a template parameter. So uh, I think it was actually Barry again uh, in a blog post uh, somewhere has uh, thought about this idea of higher order concepts where uh, I think was what you're trying to get at Tobias. Um, so yeah, some people have thought about that. Um, I don't think there's any, I don't think I've seen any proposal for that, uh, but then I don't spend most of my time in the evolution group. Okay, uh, what's what does the standard prohibit defining um, uh, or why does the standard prohibit defining uh, concepts inside structs? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's just a simplification. Uh, I think there's probably some people that would like to see that uh, restriction removed. Um, uh, again, I don't feel like I've seen a proposal for it, but then I cannot you know, read all of the standard uh, proposals um, and so forth. Um, so I'm seeing some other stuff in the chat. So that hopefully answers that one. Uh, what is your estimate of the years to be mainstream like STL and a developer's toolkit? Yeah, it's a good question. So Phil, I don't know if you were at the beginning, but at the beginning, I think we were looking at maybe 15% of the audience here. Uh, so they would be able to use concepts immediately. Uh, a big chunk of the audience said yes later. Um, you know, I'm predicting the future. So uh, it's, you know, very hard to say uh, how fast the adoption of C++ uh, 20 will be. Um, so let's see, we got a response here. Um, <clears throat> uh, currently waiting for Apple, Apple Clang. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's a good point. Um, not all the compilers are all the way there, obviously. So 
you know, I, I think, you know, if I look at like C++11 uh, as, you know, some guide of the past, um, it's clear that C++11 took probably a solid decade to get really adopted to, I don't know, I think we're sitting probably at the 80%-ish level if I remember the poll results. Excuse me. So, you know, the vast majority of the community has moved on. Um, I hope it doesn't take um, that long because quite honestly, after working with concepts, I really don't want to write libraries uh, with the old way. Uh, I really don't. Um, so I think it's important. So, um, so best guess, I would say four to five years before it's, you know, half the population or more. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, seeing none. Uh, oh, <laughs> just before I got to the magic words that <laughs> cut the session off. Uh, do you think, think libraries that add concepts should be a version to uh, or use macros? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, I was sort of alluding to that before um, in this whole idea of refactoring the concepts. Um, so I think there's a pretty good chance uh, from what I can see so far, but my experience is limited enough that I can't say for certain. Um, but, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, if I think about it, if I can refactor, you know, the interfaces to concepts instead of concrete types, then, and the concrete types that are there already just work, then I think it totally works. Like, um, all you have to do is turn on the concepts. Now, it might be actually interesting, and I hadn't thought of this until this minute, uh, I'd be curious to look at what the ranges library does here. Um, so it, I think it may very well be the case that the whole macro machinery um, that they used, you know, before concepts were available in compilers mostly, um, is just switched out largely. Um, but I don't know. I'd have to go look at that implementation. And to be honest with you, I haven't looked at it in a year and a half or so. Um, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, it seems like you know, might be a pretty good chance. I think CMC SDL2, um, I think he actually did a fork where it was more like a version two namespace or, you know, a, a, a namespace because he didn't want to break people's code. Uh, and the other problem was the concepts were still changing. Um, so, but if the concepts were exactly the same as what was already there, um, then maybe it would work. But in the case where, uh, you know, maybe that's not the case, um, you know, and the concepts are different than the original implementation, then I think you'd probably need a fork for version two. So hopefully that answers that question. Any other questions before we call it a day? Well, thanks everybody. Thanks for listening.